Let's see, I think there's like 10 of us here. So I have this theory, and I think if we do it right, we can all sit, move forward a little bit from the pews we're in and still be 20 feet apart because there's really not that many of us. So um, announcements, there's no announcements there. Okay. <laughs> I thought maybe I was just missing it or something. So um, next Sabbath, August 29th, we have a Sabbath hike, and it's at, it's a Vespers and hike, I should say. It is at Coldwater Lake, which is up near Mount St. Helens. It's about an hour drive away from here. And bring a sack lunch, eat in the car, and then join a group that is heading up to hike after church. Um, I don't know who's leading that. Generally speaking, that's Kathy Westermeyer, but I don't know if that's who's leading that one this one this week or not, or next week or not. So that looks like it'll be a good time for those that want to go. And next. Nope. <laughs> so there's a youth vespers for all of the youth. Wait, hold on. Okay, well, there's not a whole lot of youth going on in here, but there's a youth vespers next. Dave, is that Friday? Okay, so next Friday at what time? 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you, Chloe. Although it sounded weird coming from you and not Dave. Um, so we've got the Youth Vespers next Friday. Oh, where at, guys? At okay, so is it Journey Christian School? So um, for all of the youth in the room, Chloe, Henry, I think you're it. Um, so we've got that going on. And I think, is that it, Chloe? That is it for announcements. I was going to try to drag it out to see if I could bug Dave Wilson, but I'm going to be done now. Happy Sabbath. Well, good morning. It's been a while since I've been up here, but with this whole thing and whatnot, it's just crazy. Um, over the last few months, um, I don't know about you, but my life has been way up and down all the time. Start seeing some good coming, and then it crashes down. Start seeing good coming back again, and it crashes back down. And uh, it's been a tough one. And then just recently, actually just this week, um, I turned on uh, Christian radio. And I hadn't listened to Christian radio in a while. I'm so busy. I'm either on the phone or whatever. And this song came on, and it actually brought me to tears. It's a good, good father. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter what happens in our life, he's always going to be there. And he's going to be the good he, he is the good, good father. Like this first line, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of the night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. So right when I start seeing the good and it starts crashing again, I feel so alone. But he's always right there to pick me back up, amen? Amen. I invite you all to sing with me this morning. And if you'd just like to listen and just take it all in, more than welcome to as well. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they Father, it's who you are, it's who 
I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Because you were forsaken, and I'm accepted, you were condemned, and I'm alive and well, the Spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your amazing love, and we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for the chance to get together and worship you. I ask that as Dave brings us the message today, that you open our hearts and our minds so that we can hear your word for us, so that we can be able to receive the grace that you give us so freely and offer that to others in a way that will draw them close to you, closer to your throne, and closer to your coming. Be with those that are up at the church camp out today. Help them to enjoy themselves, to be safe, to grow closer to each other and to you. 
those that have to stay home, either because of the pandemic or because of other reasons, that they can be well and worship you with us online as well. We thank you for these things, and we pray all of them in your precious son's name. Amen. With the bright lights, it's hard for me to see you. <laughs> it is such a privilege and pleasure to be able to stand up here and share with my church family. I know some are not here, but those of us who are have a chance to hear some good news. I um, always make this statement before I say anything up front. And that is that when we get done today, that we will have made much of Jesus. Our scripture this morning is found in John 8, and we'll just read that account. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And they sat, he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, having set her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him in order that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they, <clears throat> when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote in the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone with the woman and the woman where she had been. In the midst. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. The Bible is about three things. It's about all about God, and it's all about us. And it's all about what God wants to do about us. And the reason there's something to be done about us is because of sin. God anticipated that might happen. And Sin was, became a problem at, in the, when the fall occurred. And uh, if God had not anticipated and stepped in with a plan, death would have been the result. There's four things that need to be considered when dealing with sin in order to resolve it and it never rise again the second time. The first thing is evil. The second thing is justice. The third thing is love. And the fourth thing is forgiveness. Hebrews tells us in chapter 1 that in Jesus, when he died, take, took all power from him who had power over death. That is the evil one. He was emasculated and all power removed from him. Justice. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of fallen man. It says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. The wages of sin were paid, 
and justice was satisfied. Jesus didn't just come down here with a CD or a DVD with the listing of all the sins of people, put it in his pocket, hang on the cross and die, and that's how he bore our sins. No, that's not what happened. 2 Corinthians 5 says that Jesus became sin for us. That means he took on the full identity of sin. And that results in separation from his father. And that sense of separation was so profound. He died, according to what Ellen White says, not seeing through the portals of a tomb for you and for me. God did love this world, and he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have eternal life. What I want to spend our time on today is the issue of forgiveness, because this is great news. Uh, I chose, as you see, <clears throat> maybe you don't have a bulletin where it's printed, but the title of what I wanted to share today is Grace on the Hoof. Grace, of course, is unmerited favor. That's favor from God that we don't have coming or deserve or have any right to. But the grace, when it's in action, takes on the characteristics and all of the dimensions and dynamics of forgiveness. That's why I want to spend some time this morning talking to you about the beauty and the power of forgiveness. Um, when I was in college, I met a, a friend who um, became a long-term friend, but I enter, even, even introduced him to his wife. His name was Rick Rice. He holds a PhD in biblical studies, and he's on the religion faculty at Loma Linda University. And um, he published one sentence. He's published several books, but he published one sentence that stuck in my brain uh, that I want to leave with you and share with you just to kind of launch us into this whole issue of what forgiveness is all about. He says, in quotes, forgiveness is what religion is all about. Now, I'm a physician, not a theologian. Um, so I go to continuing education sessions to keep my credentials up and my license current. I'm an ophthalmologist. That is, we take care of people's vision. And I went to one of these sessions in Southern California, and it lasts for four days. You're there all day. It's a, it's a, a marathon of education. And every morning they had a keynote speaker. And this particular morning, they, I noticed the program, and on there was a name I recognized. It was Dr. Chopra from Harvard Medical School in the East Coast in Boston. And he had an interesting topic title that says, How to Make Happy People. I said, boy, that's going to be interesting. Here's a liver specialist going to talk about how people stay happy. I wonder if it's if they have good liver function, but that wasn't his point. Uh, he said there are three things that make people happy. The first one is they have a lot of friends, people to interact with and care with and share with and experience life with. Number two, the happiest people make serving others a major part of their life. And number three, which surprised me, it shouldn't have, but coming from him, it did. He says, the happiest people forgive others. The happiest people forgive others. Well, forgiveness is hard because it's usually in the context of offense and offender, sin and savior. It's unfair, it's unnatural, it's undeserved, and it raises a lot of questions. 
And we're going to try to face some of those questions in the form of narrative or story this morning. Forgiveness in human experience to see if we can find some hint of answers to some of these questions. Here's just a few that we might keep in mind as we get into the story of people experiencing forgiveness. Must people repent before they can be forgiven? Is forgiveness an option, obligation, or neither? Is forgiveness a sign of weakness? Only weak people forgive. Is forgiveness conditional? Forgive if and this and this and this our realities are come back. Does forgiveness absolve the offender of their offense? What is the connection between forgiveness and reconciliation? Now, we could spend a lot of time this morning academically addressing these questions, but I think they're better um, approached in story and in human experience. So we'll give that a shot. Just to set one thing aside at the beginning, is forgiveness an option, an obligation, or neither? I don't see it as any of that. Re forgiveness is redemption energy that's unleashed when those involved in a circumstance where offense and offender is involved receive or seek and embrace forgiveness. Redemptive energy that can change everything for those who embrace it and experience it. Um, when we realize that we're all sinners, in Matthew 6 it says we are forgiven as we forgive. So it's tied to our experience with our Savior and how we interact not only with him, but with those with whom we find ourselves either in offended or offended um, offender situation. Well, let's address that question of must a person repent before they can be forgiven? There is a famous talk show host who has been on the radio for many years. His name is Dennis Prager. Many of you know who he is. He is a Jewish man, and he has a Jewish worldview and view of things. And he sees forgiveness through that worldview, and that worldview is expressed in what I'm going to share with you. He wrote the following about this issue. This forgive anybody anything doctrine, Prager argues, is a good example of the moral disarray in much of religious life. It undermines the moral foundations of a, the American civilization. Unless there are limits to forgiveness, Prager holds, there is no hope for our society. Evil and evildoers must be judged as they deserve. I have become really passionate in recent times about the biblical worldview, which doesn't suggest that approach to forgiveness or that notion about forgiveness as grace in action. Um, in fact, it's quite different. In the biblical worldview, grace comes into play when there is offense, offender, sin, and savior. And grace is offered and received, and it changes things. And as we're going to see as we share some narratives of stories, it's not connected to repentance or change on the part of the offender. Jesus and Stephen gave it a whole new dimension. If you remember, both of them were being killed for their faith. 
and belief and love and hope in God. And as they were being killed, they both said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is grace and action, even in a situation where the offender doesn't know he's even offending. If that grace and action, forgiveness, is experienced by the one being offended and the one doing the offending and has capacity to change everything. Well, let's look at story. Some of you will recall many years ago, there was an incident um, back in the Midwest where an Amish community experienced a terrible tragedy. It seems that a man who was not Amish had a family with four children. One of his youngest daughter died shortly after birth, and he had a hard time handling the grief and the tragedy of it all and felt like he had been wronged and decided he would take it out on society. He armed himself, went into an Amish school, and began shooting. He shot 10 children. A few escaped, the teacher escaped, but 10 children were shot, five died. And a horrendous sorrow has descended over the community, obviously. A book has been written about this called Amish Grace. A movie has been made about the story. It's a true story and a sad story. The head man of the Amish community, immediately after the incident, went to some of the parents of children who were lost and took the, uh, some of them with him to visit the widow of the man who shot the children because he killed himself after he killed the children. He took them to the home and he told the widow, we just want you to know that we have forgiven your husband. And that we want to be available to you for any help you might need or support for the grief you might experience in your loss. To the press, this seemed unthinkable that someone would do that. So the head man was met by a reporter. He said to him, how can you do that? How can you go say that? When such a horrible thing has been done. She says, shouldn't there be some conditions to you being making that offer to the widow of this man who destroyed these children. And he is quoted as saying to the press, forgiveness comes from an open heart without conditions or it is not forgiveness at all. Well, the father of one of the oldest girls that was killed was one of those that went to the home with him to offer the widow forgiveness. But he was having a struggle in his own home with his youngest daughter who had escaped the day of the shooting. She was having trouble hating the killer of her sister. And her father wanted to somehow get through to her the idea that when forgiveness is offered, it releases redemptive energy that changes everything. So he said this to his youngest daughter. Hate is a very big and hungry thing. 
with lots of sharp teeth and will eat up your whole heart, leaving no room for love. We are lucky God understands this. He is the one who hands out punishment so that we don't have to carry this terrible hate if we don't want to and are willing to forgive. A Protestant pastor who was over seeing the service for this older girl who, per who perished from this family, at the graveside, shared the following thoughts. We cannot pretend evil does not exist. We cannot pretend that even God-fearing men cannot be swayed by darkness to do evil acts. Acts that leave terrible pain in their wake. Our Amish brothers and sisters have shown us when we don't seek vengeance in our pain and open our hearts to the healing light of forgiveness, then the darkness is banished and evil is no more. Forgiveness changes everything. One of my favorite Christian authors is Francine Rivers, who's written a lot of books. Using her creative thinking and her literary ability to form stories that capture the essence of mighty themes in the Bible and forgiveness being one. She wrote a series called the Mark of the Lion series. And the essence of what that is about is that a true to life story of a 12 year old girl who was in Jerusalem at the time Titus overthrew Jerusalem was taken captive by the Roman forces back to Rome and sold into the service of a Roman family where she became the one who was tending to and uh, serving a beautiful young woman. Who was caught up in the society and the excitement of the Roman culture. This young girl was a follower of the way. She was a Christian girl who believed in Jesus and his sacrifice for her sins. As this relationship developed between the young woman and her, Julia, the young woman, becomes intolerant of her, decides that she should be done away with because she's a Jew and because she sees things quite differently than she does. She arranges for her to be taken from her home, grouped up with the Christians who were going to the lions in the arena to be destroyed. The day comes, she goes into the arena with the other Jews and most of all, the Jews were killed. But by some miracle, she, being badly mauled, survived, scarred, and left to die. Now, the usual practice was in those days that when somebody survived the arena, they were used for medical experimentation and then allowed to die. But a Roman doctor took a liking to her and nursed her back to health. And she became part of his team to minister to others. But she still had a burden in her heart for the family that had purchased her and knew she was still their property. To make a short story long or a long story short, depending on how you look at it, she found a way to come back into the service of the family, but hid her identity. She wore the clothes of the day in a face veil with only her eyes showing and went back into the service of Julia, who now, instead of being a beautiful young woman, was a deathly sick young, uh, middle-aged woman, not middle-aged, still young, 
who needed constant care. And Hadassah, the young girl, lovingly, conscientiously, steps into that role to be her care caregiver. And to make the, get you to where I want you to be in this story, circumstances come to be, and she gets so seriously ill that eventually Hadassah reveals her identity to Julia. And Julia realizes the girl she thought was dead and eaten by the lions was the one who was tending to her needs so lovingly and had totally forgiven her. That's the story. It's told much more beautifully and eloquently in the book. But what I want to share with you is what happens with that story. I had uh, won a trip from Los Angeles to Kuala Lumpur, Borneo. And uh, my wife and I uh, were looking forward to this trip and we like to read on the airplane. So we began reading this story, this trilogy. Uh, there's three books to it and we read the first book. And when we got ready to leave from Los Angeles, we had the second book in our hand, waiting to get on the airplane and an attorney who was to join us on this flight to Borneo from Texas, saw we had book two. She had read book one and wanted book two. So she came to us and asked us if we would let her have our book two to read on the airplane. We told her no, we hadn't read it ourselves and we were gonna keep it. She was disappointed, but uh, we went about our flight, we flew to uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, and then to uh, Kota Kinabalu, Borneo. And in the course of the flight and the time we were there and coming back, we finished book two. Got to Tokyo to return to Los Angeles, and the attorney comes to us in line and says, did you finish the book? We said, yes, we finished the book. She says, can I take it with me and read it as we fly home from here? And I said, we said, sure. So she took the book. From Tokyo to Los Angeles going that way, it's nine hours in the airplane. She got within 75 pages of the end of the book when the plane landed and we disembarked and she asked if she could keep the book and finish it and we said yes. She's reading the story about the forgiveness in this whole thing about this Julia who had sent this Hadassah to the lions and then was nursed lovingly and forgiven. I didn't get the book back right away. She said she would mail it, but about six weeks later, I got the book with a letter. And in the letter, she says, I just have to tell you the impact of that book on me. I said, well, I'd like to hear it. So I kept reading the letter. She says, within a week or two of when we arrived back in the United States, we had a terrible family tragedy. She said, my sister-in-law acquired a firearm and shot and killed my brother. And she is in prison and ready to stand trial. She says, because I read the story of Hadassah and the forgiveness experienced by all involved in that whole story, I was able to go to the prison, visit my sister-in-law, and tell her that I forgave her for killing my brother. I filed that letter away and kept it with me because that summer I went to a writer's conference where I was seeking to have my book published and have some Christian publishers look at it. 
and united by tragedy, which I shared with this congregation the first time I was given the privilege to share here. And one of the individuals that attended that conference was Francine Rivers, who had written the book, Books of the Trilogy. I found her at lunch one day, and I said, I want you to read this letter I received. She read it, and she was moved beyond belief about the power and the beauty of redemptive energy released when forgiveness is experienced by those who grant it and those who receive it. I like to think of forgiveness as weak power. It appears weak, but it's powerful. And it opens the doors to reconciliation that would never be opened otherwise. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it means it's possible now. Well, there was a very controversial book written um, by a man who wrote it as an allegory to his personal life, which was very troubled. The name of the book was called The Shack, written, written by William Paul Young. And if one re reads the book without the idea that it's not a theology book to teach us about it, teachings or doctrine and that kind of stuff, but about what happens in a troubled life. It takes on a different look. Let me just share with you a quick synopsis of it because there is one sentence in the end of the book I want to share with you and have you memorize and hold in your heart. The shack features in the allegory of his life, Mackenzie, who has three children. And they go on a camping trip to northeastern Oregon. And in their camping trip, one morning, two of the kids get in a canoe, go out in the lake. He walks down to watch them. And the youngest girl is left back in camp. And while his back is turned and he's paying attention to the other kids, the younger girl is kidnapped carried off and murdered. He goes home and is obviously devastated. And he gets, how he gets the message, I'm not perfectly clear, the idea that he needs to go back to the cabin the camping area where this happened. And he goes back by himself. And while he's heading for the cabin, he's carried into kind of a dreamlike, trance-like state that takes him out of his circumstance and brings him to this cabin, which now is not in a winter scene, but in a summer scene with a fireplace and green grass and the lake is beautiful and clouds are gorgeous, everything is wonderful. He's taken into a, a, this experience in his mind. And he knocks on the door of the cabin. And he's met by the personification of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, in a personification context. And invited in, and they begin to interact with him to help him deal with his grief and his hatred, desire to get even, resentment, and victimhood. And to make this, get to where I want to get with this, he spends in his mind several day, two or three days in this experience. And they come to the end, sort of the last day of the experience, and the personification of God says, we're going to go find the remains of your daughter and give them a proper burial. 
So he takes him to the trailhead, and they follow the trailhead up, and then they get within a few hundred yards of where she is buried by the one who did this. And they sit down on the rock and says, before we go further, I need to talk to you about your heart and the need for you to forgive the one who did this to your daughter. He can hardly take it. He breaks down and sobs. How can I be expected to forgive the one who took the life of my daughter? They have a conversation. And as they get to the point where he begins to finally surrender his heart to the idea of forgiveness, the personification of God speaking to him says to him, I need you to take your hands off the throat of the offender, the killer of your daughter, so that I can redeem you both. Did you hear that? You see, God is not willing that any should perish. But he says when we retain and are slaved and prisoned to our hatred and our resentment and our need to get even, we cripple the ability of God to do either. Redeem the offender or the offender. I've thought about that a lot since I read that one sentence. Forgiveness is taking your hands off the throat of the offender so that I can redeem you both. You see, the redemptive energy released by forgiveness as it's exercised, experienced, received, and given has the capacity to do all that. God is not willing that any should perish and wants to have a pathway and a road, a conduit to redeeming even the most evil because he loves everyone passionately. Debbie Morris was a young lady who wrote a book called Forgiving the Dead Man Walking. And um, some of you have heard about the dead man walking experience. But Debbie was a 18-year-old girl who was with her boyfriend out getting a milkshake one evening at about 11 p.m., and while they were sitting there in the parking lot enjoying their milkshake, talking to each other, a car pulled up, two men got out, and kidnapped them. They put them in the car, put Debbie in the trunk, put him in the car, took him out into the country. They took the boy out, tied him to a tree, tortured him, beat him, left him to die. They took her out of the trunk of the car, put her in the car, and for the next 36 hours, they took turns sexually abusing her. During the third day of the experience, they finally drove her back to her hometown and totally unexpected, pulled over in her town, opened the door, let her out, and took off. It turns out that these two men, three days before, had done the same to another and murdered someone. But for some reason, they let her go. And now she's stuck with this terrible abuse and shame. 
that was committed against her and her boyfriend. By the way, her boyfriend did survive. She tried to find peace. And she was con really convicted that if she would just get justice, she would have peace. Well, as it turned out, within a few days, they captured the two guys, and they were put on trial. They were found guilty, and one of them was sentenced to death for first-degree murder. and other charges related to her abuse. And she said, when he gets put to death and justice is served, I will have peace. Well, it turns out he was executed and she did not have peace. And the part of her most of the part of her book is about how she had to come to the, the point where she was willing to take her hands off the throat of the murderer and the offender and the abuser and allow redemptive energy to do its work wherever it could be received and experienced, even in the guilty. Earthly justice does not bring healing and peace. Forgiveness has nothing to do with absolving the criminal of their crime. Forgiveness has everything to do with lifting the burden of being a victim, letting go of the pain, anger, hurt, and need to get even. Well, these are pretty dramatic stories that we heard. Just a couple of simple things to complete a picture. I have a nephew, Greg. Greg has a girl, living girlfriend, Michelle. We were together for a holiday meal. After the meal, we were sitting at the table. They were sitting on the other side of the table. My brother-in-law was sitting beside him. I was across the table. Something came up on the cell phone, my brother-in-law's cell phone. And he reported what it was and showed it to me. And I made some simple jest and remark about what was on the cell phone. And um, thought nothing of it. But my nephew, Greg, wouldn't speak to me. Because he had been so offended by what I had said. I didn't even know that I'd said something that offended him. Finally, several weeks later, my brother-in-law, Jim, came to me and he says, you're not supposed to know this. But we had this little encounter with the cell phone and my son Greg is so offended that, that he isn't going to speak to you, and you're not supposed to know why. He said to me, you did nothing to offend him. I heard everything. I was there. I was part of it. And frankly, this is completely unjustified um, offense. You did nothing wrong. But you're not, he's not supposed to, I'm not supposed to know that. So it went on for a few more weeks and he wouldn't speak to me. Finally, I said enough's enough and I decided that I would bite the bullet, so to speak. I think, you know, the Holy Spirit worked on me and so I wrote him a note. I sent him a message. 
And this is what the message said. It has come to my attention that I spoke unkindly and unthinkingly in your presence. What I said deeply offended you both, and for this, I want to say I am really sorry. I'm asking for you both to forgive me for this. I love and respect you both and pray you will give me another chance to be part of your lives. Uncle Dave. Almost immediately, I got a return message. Uncle Dave, I love you and Aunt Janet, and I forgive and forget. I hope you will do the same. I wasn't sure I'd done anything wrong. In fact, I was sure I had done nothing wrong. But giving forgiveness a chance to release its redemptive energy into this circumstance created an opportunity for reconciliation that never would have happened. Well, as I was thinking about that, I had a chance to remember an incident that happened. Some of you may know Pastor Clarence Schultz, I don't know, but he used to be pastor up at Port Orchard Church here, uh, north of us up on the Puget Sound somewhere. And he and his wife had a disagreement. And he knew he was right. And she thought he was wrong. And there's something about knowing you're right that gives you permission to be mean and attack the person who thinks you're wrong. They were driving along in the car and they were having this tense agreement about it. He knew he was right and she ought to get her act together and blah, 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 blah. You know how we act when we're angry. And we think we're right. Finally, it got silent in the car. And after a long silence, driving along, his wife finally said to him, would you rather be right or happy? Clarence in his book, How to Die Right and Live to Tell About It, records this incident. And he says, it's better to be kind. than right. Well, there are, are there consequences to unforgiveness and forgiveness? Someone has characterized, you've probably heard it, that unforgiveness is drinking poison, hoping the other person will die. You see, unforgiveness blocks all the action and the flow of redemptive energy housed in grace as it's practiced in forgiveness. What are the consequences of forgiveness? Forgiveness sets the prisoner free, and the prisoner is you. Free from a sense of victimhood, free from anger, resentment, and hurt. It returns the offender back to his humanity and to the hands of God for punishment, justice, and yes, redemption. 
Forgiveness takes your hands off the throat of the offender so that God can redeem both. If they will just receive his love and his offer of forgiveness. Well, there's a text in Hebrews, Hebrews 10 that says this. This is about verse number 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their mind I will write them. And then he says, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. You see, forgiveness practiced, received and given has no memory. Only a future when embraced and practiced and given opportunity to act. Well, back to our original text. In John 8, the adulterous woman, Jesus asks her, where are those who accuse you? She says, they're gone. Jesus says, neither do I accuse you. Then he says, go and stop doing the things that hurt you. Sin no more. And we know from the record that she did. And toward the end of his life, in the face of those who looked at her critically, she went in to wash the feet of Jesus and dry them with her hair. Jesus in Matthew 26, 13 says, wherever the gospel is preached, the story of Mary's forgiveness will be told. You're in. 
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. We're so thankful for your promise that we will just behold him. We will become like him. Give us his heart, his mind, and his love, and his ability to care. Give us the ability to forgive like Jesus and experience the power and beauty of the release of redemptive energy forgiveness brings to those who live within their reality and practice. We pray these things in your name. Amen.